Right, um, yeah, my name is Alex Creasy and I'm currently uh, undertaking an MSc at Newcastle University um, and this talk is going to be on my dissertation uh, project which I'm undertaking with the transactions team at Red Hat and is on live profiling and analysis of distributed atomic transactions. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today, um, firstly I'm going to give a quick primer on what atomic transactions are, why they're useful and a few pitfalls you can fall into when using them. I'm going to talk out about how uh, transactional issues are currently troubleshooted uh, using JBoss application server. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the tool I've designed and how that will hopefully address these problems and some example use cases of the tool. So, firstly, so what are atomic transactions? Well, essentially they're a fault tolerance mechanism. They uh, provide some strong guarantees that any work that's undertaken within the context of the transaction will either all take place or none of it will. So that is, if it doesn't take place, all the changes that have been made will be rolled back and uh, won't be seen. So, and these uh, guarantees are provided within the presence of failures. So that could be uh, network outages, server crashes, um, things of that nature. So I'm now just going to mention a little bit about transactional middleware. Um, and basically, they enable a software developer uh, to add these transactions to their software without having to be a transaction expert. I mean, writing transactional uh, uh, code, transaction manager, is by no means an easy undertaking. And uh, the, the middleware just allows you to make use of these without needing that expert knowledge. So uh, a little bit more information. I'm just going to go briefly over the two-phase commit protocol. Um, there are other consensus protocols around uh, three-phase commit and others. I'm just, as, as two-phase is what the JBoss uh, transaction manager uses, that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, so why is it there? A consensus is essential um, among participants in order to assure this atomic outcome, i.e. I. that either all the work is done or none of it is. Um, <clears throat> and so we have this idea of a transaction coordinator who's there to enforce this decision amongst participants in the transaction. These could be databases, message queues, um, resources of that nature. So uh, as the name suggests, it takes place in two phases. Um, in the first phase, the coordinator will ask all the participants that are enlisted within this transaction context to either vote to commit or abort, so whether they can make these changes or not. Uh, in phase two, the coordinator will uh, enforce this decision and make sure it takes place. So if all the participants vote to commit, uh, the coordinator ensures that uh, all the participants durably commit these changes. If a single one of the participants votes abort, then the whole transaction, the, the coordinator will make sure the whole transaction rolls back. Okay, the, 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 it does cover a lot more and that's a very uh, kind of sparse view of the two-phase commit protocol, but that, that should be enough uh, to follow where I'm going. Okay, so for using transactions, some potential problems. Now, uh, obviously they provide these strong guarantees, but there is no, uh, you, you can't say for certain that transactions are going to commit. If you, uh, you can find yourself in a situation where you're getting large numbers of transactions rolling back, it can affect your uh, system performance uh, significantly. Uh, this can be caused by, for example, bad application design. Uh, there's also with transactions, there's a myriad of other problems you can uh, wind up with. Uh, timeouts, heuristics, wedge, wedge transactions, the list goes on. I'm not going to specifically explain those. I'm going to pick a few of those examples later, um, and I'll go into them in a bit more detail. But in any case, finding the root cause of these problems is really not an easy undertaking. So I'm going to talk now about the current methods of troubleshooting um, uh, transactions using JBoss application server. So in the first scenario, we've got here a centralized application where we've just got this single JBoss server node that's enlisting two separate resources. Um, it could be a MySQL database. I've put a Postgres database here. But uh, so the, the important thing here is that we've just got this one JBoss server node. Well. In order to troubleshoot that, basically you've 
got no choice but to spend some face time with the log files. Um, I mean, it, it's. I hope you can get an idea from it there. It's really not an intuitive way of doing things. You have to turn on trace logging, and this trace logging was not designed for um, end users to actually troubleshoot these uh, problems. It's very implementation specific. Um, as you, you can see whirling through a lot of class names from the uh, Nariana Transaction Manager. Um, yeah, the, the, really unless you have an idea what's going on, they don't really mean a lot to you. So um, that's basically what you have to do. Um, now if we look at, for example, uh, a distributed application, sorry, um, we've got here um, the one JBoss server um, enlisting two participants, it's then propagating this transaction context to the second server, which is enlisting some more resources, um, troubleshooting that. Uh, yeah, you've now got two log files to look at, and you have to really patch together uh, what's happening. Um, and to actually get an idea of what's going on in the overall transaction context from two log files, um, I can tell you it's more than twice as hard is trying to browse one. Um, if you've got four, you, you, you can see where I'm going with this. You, you kind of, looking at them, it, it's just not an easy way of doing things. It is really quite a frustrating task at the end of the day. So uh, just to kind of formalize what I've said there, um, this expert knowledge is currently required in order to troubleshoot um, transactions. And a Red Hat support team, uh, they get from their customers who've got transactional issues. They do get um, cases coming where they have to spend a lot of time looking and trying to resolve these issues. And in the cases where they don't, these issues are then pushed up to the transactions team. So the, the software developers who should be spending their time uh, writing new software, fixing bugs, that kind of thing. It's, uh, that, 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 that is a kind of thing they should be doing not spending their time troubleshooting these transaction issues. So going on, we've also got this, it's really difficult to get a global view of the transactional behavior in the system from these log files. I mean, you get individual events coming through that even if you have worked out how um, you're going to piece these together, you, you can't kind of get this top-down view of all the transactions and what they're doing. Um, and as I said, the problem becomes increasingly acute when you're searching multiple log files. And it's pretty much impossible to do with a live system. I mean, if you want to tail dash F for log files in terminal windows and try and pass through possibly 100 or so lines a uh, second coming through, um, probably even more, to be honest, then uh, good luck. So uh, the project aim, what I've um, attempted to do here is that uh, we're looking to make this transaction metadata that's within these log files available to end users and support staff in a way that they can really make use of and that cuts down this time taken to do it, removes some of the expertise required and just ideally try and push these support cases back down the chain. So far fewer are coming to the um, uh, software engineering team. Uh, that they're staying with the support, the support team. And again, ideally, this tool could be rolled out to users so that their Red Hat aren't even getting support cases in the first place. So we've got some requirements uh, that we want it to be transaction specific. Now there's a number of tools out there that deal with uh, monitoring business transactions, which really are a different kettle of fish. You can be looking at anything from point of sale, um, it's a very broad umbrella term and we're very specifically looking at atomic transactions and want a tool that can uh, profile these and give you an idea of what's going on with them in a system. We want to be able to gather information from a live and offline system. So ideally be able to have a tool that we can plug into JBoss and find out what's going wrong. But at the same time, we might also want to be able to take log files from customers, have them submit them and they'll be able to process them later to work out what's going on. Uh, we want to be able to do this for centralized and distributed cases. Uh, we want to be able to harvest some detailed transaction metadata. So particularly with regards to the two-phase commit protocol, as I mentioned, we want to know which resources are preparing, 
um, whether they're uh, rolling back, whether they're committing, whether we're getting other outcomes like heuristic outcomes, uh, all, all these kind of possible information we can get, um, we want to be able to, re uh, to replay ideally from this the whole transaction if we want in a kind of event style log. Um, we want times, so run times of the transactions, basically as much data as we can get our hands on in, able to, in order to be able to uh, do some interesting stuff and make some assertions on this data. So uh, we also want to provide the expert knowledge required to spot these common problem scenarios. So we want a means of automating what the transaction teams are doing once we've got this data model built and be able to spot some common problem scenarios um, programmatically for the user. And we want to make it extensible enough to be easily adapted to future problem scenarios. So I'm going to give you a bit of a technical overview of the tool as it, uh, of, of uh, how it was developed in the end. Now you can see we've got this uh, core module here. Now that is the absolute backbone of the uh, tool that's responsible for populating uh, this data model that we need. And we can see it deployed in a distributed um, environment in this case. We've got uh, the first server, or we've got the core module um, deployed alongside some of the other parts of the tool, which I'll talk about in a minute. But this, this core module is also fully autonomous in that we can deploy it in any other servers in this distributed application and it will build the data model for us. So how does this core module work? Well, at the base it's got a pattern matching engine um, that uh, can consume uh, log lines as they're produced by the uh, server and it passes them up to this data analysis layer. Now, now this is essential because a lot of the log lines lack context and by that I mean there's not really enough information from this line by itself to see which transaction it may necessarily belong to or what that line by itself may actually mean. So we need to do some inference based on log lines that have come before it um, and we can do some other tricks as well by possibly um, we can follow thread IDs and various other uh, kind of indicators that are uh, happening within the transaction server in order to piece together this data model. The other thing we, we've also got is that when we're trying to build a distributed data model where we've got these, we've got it deployed, this possibly, this, this scenario here, I put two to n, you could have any additional number of nodes with this setup here. You've also got the problem that you're then parsing these in an asynchronous manner. There's, there's no guarantee that these events are going to match up time-wise. So this data analysis has to be able to handle that and still be able to develop the data model. And we do that through this shared data store. We're able to slowly piece together the, uh, the actual overall picture of a transaction as the data comes in. So that, that's the core module. We've also got these um, additional uh, modules that can be installed. They are actually detachable from the core module but uh, you can install them alongside it. We've got this plugin framework. Now, this provides the expert knowledge I was talking about earlier. It's, um, it takes a high-level analysis of the data that we've retrieved and then looks for patterns that may be the sign of common faults. And it, it's an extendable plugin framework. You can just uh, implement an interface and you can easily add in new um, plugins that will detect common problems as they arise. So as, as you're getting more and more support cases for them, they can quickly uh, be developed and plugged into the tool. We then also have at the very top the web user interface, which is how the user interacts with the tool. So I'm going to just give you um, a few screenshots of the uh, uh, user interface, just because it shows a bit of relevant information. So this, this is the kind of global view of the transactions you get. You've got a list of all the transactions that um, are occurring in the system uh, here. You can see the um, node they originated from, uh, whether they're distributed or not. Um, more importantly, though, we've got this uh, status of the transaction and the duration. So we can see, we can see a few different uh, outcomes there. We've got committed, aborted. We've got a heuristic outcome there. Um, we've got 
also the phase one abort, uh, one that's preparing at the moment. And we can filter these down so we can get that global view of transactions that are in a specific state based on what we're specifically interested in. And we've also got on the right here, we've got the actual plugin manager um, interface. And this will pop up alerts um, showing you any potential issues it may have detected um, in your system. So let's drill on. You can then drill on into the actual transaction and get some more details. So in this case, we can see we're, we're looking at uh, one node of a distributed transaction. Uh, we can see the current status of the transaction. We get the JBoss node ID. We get the start time, uh, the end time if applicable, duration. Uh, the kind of more interesting side here, you get this list of enlisted participants, um, which actually gives you quite a useful amount of information there. So you get the product name uh, that we, we take from the uh, JCA architecture. Um, you get the JNDI name so that you can identify the specific product. And we even get its vote in the uh, two-phase commit protocol. So I mean, as you can see here, we've got two re resources there at the moment. The um, tool is mid-preparing, uh, mid so we've got the first vote in from the first result to its commit, and we're still awaiting the second. Um, we've also got this event timeline, so we can actually go through and replay the events of the transaction as they happened. Okay. So having seen a bit of the main interface, I'd now just like to go through a couple of example use cases for the tool. So we've got the first one. Um, uh, clients come with the symptom they're presenting is that they're getting many transaction rollbacks. It's a fairly vague symptom to get, but obviously it, it's really not an ideal situation to be in for your system to be getting a high number of rollbacks in your system. So what happens? You install the tool, you get it running for a while until it's built up enough data to actually um, uh, to make a decision about this, and we can see then the plugin pops up and lo and behold the plugins detected that the uh, Postgres database is the root cause of failure in greater than 5% of transactions. Now, the 5% the is just an arbitrary figure I've used for demonstration here but you can fine tune that as part of the, the expert knowledge we're looking for. Um, so what do you get? It alerts the user presenting the product name version in JNDI name again. Um, offers the user to search the forums for help. Uh, I mean, at the moment, that's really a bit of a placeholder feature. You, you can add in keywords and it will search the forum, but it, that, it's more of a demonstration. I think ideally you'd be looking for these common issues um, to just be helping them to some actual documents that talk about how you actually resolve these. And it also will allow the user to inspect failed transactions a bit more closely. So. If I go through, we can look through and see that uh, uh, the, the transactions that failed is enlisted to participants. Um, we've got this Postgres database that's voted abort and thrown an XA error uh, exception in the process. There's also um, the Hornet queue, so we can get a bit, bit more of an idea of which transaction uh, we're looking at. Um, we can take a step back in the distributed case if we want with a visualization of the transaction. Now, um, sadly not showing up brilliantly on the projector, but um, I'll go over. You've got this um, general graph here. We can see the hierarchy of the nodes and the resources they've been listed. So we've got a green for um, a commit vote and the red here for the voting uh, to abort. And again, that, that can just give us more of a high-level overview of the transaction and what's happening. So it's about making this data easier for the user to consume. Okay, I'm going to look at a um, second example use case here. So symptoms, again, a vague one we're presenting with code hanging. So uh, if I just explain that a bit, if, if we're looking at an application where we're getting... Uh, uh, threads hanging in the application, um, they're getting stuck. And we're not getting the results back of transactions, they're just uh, uh, stuck in flight. And, and okay, this is an odd scenario, but 
well, what do you do? It, it's not really enough information from the symptoms there to actually find out what's happening. So again, install the tool, keep it running whilst it builds up uh, some data, and we get this plugin pop up that the plugins detected a wedge transaction and alerts a user. Now, a wedge transaction is um, essentially caused by a deadlock. It, it, it's it, it's not a nice problem to have. Um, if we go back to the two-phase commit protocol again, um, when a coordinator asks a set of resources uh, to prepare, so to place their votes, if they're going to vote commit, uh, before they do so, they must have obtained any locks that they will require, uh, so be it locks on database tables, locks on any resources, but they, they have to acquire these locks before they can vote to commit. And so what we end up with is an old-fashioned deadlock scenario where various resources are competing for locks that the others have and they want... So, it, yeah, essentially you're, you're looking for uh, at resource contention here for... Um, sorry, I should say locking contention between resources. Um, but so the plugin's popped up here and it's detected you've got a wedge transaction here. Um, allows you to follow through and see see what's happening and then in this case you can actually have a look through the event log and trace through we can see that the transaction uh, began uh, at the server it's enlisted two resources um, the transaction has attempted to prepare the first resource has come in been asked to prepare and it's a returned uh, prepare okay and then we've got this last resource here that's been asked to prepare and nothing's happened. So we've got an idea there exactly of which resource is responsible um, uh, for causing this. And so it, it, ideally then the, the uh, software developer can go back and look at the application they've written and make changes in order to try and avoid these deadlocks, which things like ensuring they obtain locks in the right order, that sort of, uh, that sort of thing. Okay. So uh, results in this sense. So the tool, it can gather data from a live system in a centralized and distributed configurations as needed. It, it, so it can consume uh, log lines from the application server as they're produced and build up this data model. Um, it's got the user interface provides a global view of transaction behavior and most importantly it also provides this global view of a distributed transaction which is obviously when we were looking at it before, we're spanning across multiple log files. You've got it in this nice one compact view. Um, it's got the option to drill down on specific transactions and get the detailed view of the behavior of the transactions, the different events that went on, um, and in information you really need to troubleshoot this. So it, it reduces the complexity of the data with graphic visualizations and data tables. So again, you're not trying to almost pick a needle in a haystack out of a log file you, you just it's all there presented for you um, and we've also got the extensible plugin framework uh, that's providing the expert knowledge to spot the common support cases um, uh, which, which so as I've explained that that plugin framework they um, if support cases are arising in a lot of uh, if, if Red Hat support uh, retrieve uh, say receiving a number of tickets a day uh, about about a specific issue we, they can quickly develop another plugin that allow the tool to adapt and continue to be useful in these situations okay. mm -hmm. so, lastly um, further work well it needs to be rolled out um, to users and before that it, it is very much a prototype at the moment it does need um, a lot of uh, uh, the crease is ironed out, um, etc. So that's certainly the next uh, stage to go to. The tool is actually going to be released as a community project um, as part of JBoss and Ariana um, and rolling it out to get that community feedback going and to really start um, the development process of getting this tool into a, a production ready uh, uh, application. Um, further work, create additional plugins for more problem scenarios. I think that's pretty much self-evident from what I've discussed. 
Um, performance, impact, evaluation and improvement, that's going to be a big one. Uh, I mean, the tool's been developed as a prototype proof of concept, but if you're going to be installing it um, in a production server, you're not going to want it to have a huge footprint in terms of memory, in terms of CPU drain. And uh, at, at the moment, the, there are some things that would need to be looked at. I mean, the, the regex engine that's used to actually pass the log files will certainly need some optimizing because it is, it is an expensive way of doing that. Um, and also integrating the tool into um, a knowledge base um, is gonna be something that's very worthwhile, which that kind of bridges the gap from finding what the, uh, the causes of the problems and um, enabling the user to solve these problems themselves. So, so uh, thanks very much. Uh, I think I'm about five minutes short of time there, but if anyone's got any questions, please feel free. Questions from the remote attendees. Oh, yeah, sure. I'm just going to put this microphone on. So it should be. Okay, should be capturing the audio from the room now. Um, okay, so. Well, I guess it's more feedback as well. So. Um, so if you go to the technical overview slide. Yes. Oh, did you call it technical overview? Yeah. So this is from Jonathan Lee. Okay. Um, <coughs> So basically, he's saying that he thinks um, he could do with a bit more. What's what, what he says? He, he could do a bit more context. So um, I think what he's saying here is it's it's not it's not clear how it kind of fits in with your project. Sort of. I think he wants to kind of have a bit more information okay. about how it fits in with the tool. So I think. So my I think my <coughs> issue with this slide was that it wasn't clear why it was distributed. Okay. So I, I, it's difficult because I've seen this slide. Yeah, yeah, I've, yeah, no, I've, I seen, understand. I've so. seen it a number of times. So yeah. I think trying to see it as a fresh, it wasn't clear to me why you had multiple servers doing this. Okay. And it was, it, it, in some respects, I could have imagined that each server was independent mm. and for some reason you decided to centralize the processing. Which, right, Which I is see, fair yeah. enough in, <clears throat> anyway, which kind of makes sense because you might have one single console to look at this. Mm. But I think the key thing you need to mention is the fact that the transactions are distributed yeah. over these servers, yeah. okay. and the only real, you know, the mm -hmm. only way of getting the bigger picture of an individual distributed mm -hmm. transaction is by, you know, yeah. by kind of combining this data together. Okay. I don't know if other people did they find. Uh, I well, to be honest, from my understanding of it, I'm wondering why JBoss Server One has to do the analysis of it. Why couldn't it be JBoss? Debug server one or something like that, you know, a, a totally separate one. It, it could be. It, yeah. You know, I, I think mm. that is something, you know, it doesn't have to, from mm. my understanding of what you said, it doesn't mm. have to be tied into being one of the servers that you're. No, no, you know, it, it so doesn't so have to be. You have your uh, an, um, logging agents which grab mm. the logs and gather the information and put it into a shared data store, and then yeah. you have your analysis agent which goes and works out what's going on. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that right. could be anywhere, effectively. It doesn't have to be on one of your servers. No, that's, that's very that, true. Yeah. That might be worth yeah. making clear. So this was okay. a design decision Alex had to make yeah. when he was... <coughs> I think, do you, yeah, do you remember the... Do you remember why why you made this decision as opposed to centralising the processing? Um, why, we used the, uh, why I made that decision, why we had it that way. I, th I think it basically grew out of... I think it evolved as the tool was originally developed just for processing centralized transactions in a single server and it kind of made sense in some ways then to be able to have one tool that you could just plug in and did everything from that point of view. Uh, at which point I think once it, once it starts being developed as a uh, uh, to cope with distributed transactions um, yeah, at which point obviously you don't need a web user interface, you only need it in, on one server. So I think that's really why I stayed that way. But to, to be honest, yes, you know, you, you probably get better performance out of actually having that in a separate. I think it was simpler, wasn't it? I think yeah. that was one of the reasons because we wanted to. Yeah. We were kind of conscious about getting a prototype out I, as quickly as possible. I can see it makes it simpler. It yeah. might be. Yeah. Not necessarily. You, you, you know, whether that diagram is, you know, I'm sure it's correct in the way it's been done, but mm. whether it's logically 
Yeah. But the way that he, yeah, he, so, you know, to describe it to people. I don't actually think it's that much. I don't think Alex would have to change very much, no. if anything, yeah. because I, I think it's just it's love for Jim. We can use web user interface and plugin. If you, instead of reading from the console, if you had a remote, the log4j allows you to log, if, you can log to the console, you can log to file, you can also log to remote servers. So if you had a remote log4j server, that could be reading the logs from all the locations and processing them. And the other good thing about this is if it is, if it does, if it is using up a lot of CPU time, then at least you can isolate it to a single machine and it can run behind and you're not affecting your other servers. So they're just logging as they would before, albeit at a higher level than you would want to in production. Well, certainly if you're talking about logging it into Red Hat's core, you effectively almost want the analysis thing to be on a separate machine. Mm -hmm. So remote JBoss is good, in theory, upload a set of logs and that's he just gets yeah, you yeah. know FTP up or whatever and an automated analysis just that's sends you a, an email back saying Ping. Yeah, so that's the other <coughs> one I remember should be letting Alex speak. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you explain the other I'm thinking case. in general it's one of those that I've I've designed it in such a way that you can separate off yeah. that feature without yeah. really fully envisaging the use case beyond there, just thinking that probably you wouldn't want to install them together. I think you're right from that diagram, it's probably but it, is, it is actually a feature that you can separate that and yeah. because there obviously is a performance hit. There's a performance hit in the core module, there's a performance hit in the plugin framework, so it's, uh, yeah. And, yeah, and it might be worth just highlighting that on that diagram. Yeah. yeah, so there's another use case that I don't think Alex has mentioned in this <coughs> talk, which he doesn't he didn't <coughs> implement, but it's quite key. And that's where customers can upload a log file, which is what they do at the moment, so they'll say, They'll create a support ticket, they'll say something's gone wrong, here's the log file, uh -huh. and then the support guys will then go through the log file trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah. But the obvious thing then to do is to have this tool automatically parse that log file and have it all there ready prepared so that when the support person comes to look at the ticket, they see the log file, but they also see the view yeah. of the transactions so they can go and you know figure it out. So uh, again, it's all the pieces are there. It's just the. Um, you just need packaging up for part of the user. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. It or yeah. yeah. So, just let me check with Jonathan. Because um, he was saying about. Jonathan was saying about context. I'm not sure if. Oh, I don't know why I'm typing. You can hear me. <laughs> Jonathan, did we, um, did we answer your question about context? Are you saying that you think we need some more context before you see this slide? So I think my issue around the context was I didn't kind of understand why it needed to be distributed. Oops. Um, okay, I might have lost my video, but. Hmm. Um, is, is any, is it, can somebody type in the chat to say that the video is still working? Because I've just been disconnected and reconnected. Okay. Okay, so it seems to be working for everyone else. It's just me. Okay. Um, so, Jonathan, did we answer your question about context? Or was there anything else you wanted to add? Okay, so John's saying that um, he was also indicating context versus prior explanation of transactions in general, i.e. slide header. Okay, so do you understand what I mean? I'm not, I don't, I'm not quite following you, Jonathan. Sure, no. <coughs> Sorry, I thought you were just waiting for more to come off the ticket, eh? No, I was yeah. kind of thinking. Um, I think you have to crunch your login levels up maximum. Yeah, but just for the transactions, that. not for yeah. everything. <coughs> but it's, I think that's. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, so I think the other thing that you need to say as well is that you don't have this on all the time. You need to make it clear that yeah. you just turn it on. I think you kind of alluded to it, but you turn it on when you detected that there's a problem. So you've got your symptoms, like lots of transaction rollbacks, but there's no, there isn't enough information that's happening. Well, you're not even the logs to tell you that that's happening until you increase the log levels. So you can't use it kind of Travis to after the. Not initially, no. Yeah. But something we'd like to do in the future is always going to add an overhead. 
but not necessarily as much as it does at the moment. But it's like if you have a, the way we see it is if you have a performance problem, so your system, you're getting low throughput, your system's running slowly, you don't know what's causing that until you attach a profiler. Yeah. And then you attach the profiler and figure out what's going on. But you would never leave a profiler attached in production 24 7. Yeah. So it's, and we kind of seen it as a similar kind of type of tool. But we would like to lower the overhead, of course, in the future, but it's, it's just more work. So, um, Yeah, so I'm, I'm afraid, Jonathan, I'm not, I don't really understand your question, so I'll, I'll try repeating it, um, and if, if anybody else understands it then. So Jonathan's saying, however, I was also indicating context versus prior explanation of transaction in general, i.e. the slide header, which being technical overview of the tool. Oh, I see. So, I don't know, maybe... So, uh, so the heading's not particularly... Maybe. I'm not sure. I think maybe we have to move on to the next question. Oh, oh hang on. Um, maybe change it to tool overview. Yeah, that might be tool deployment. Oh, okay, so I think what Jonathan's saying is, if you go back a few slides, you're talking about transactions in general, but then you jump straight into the technical details of the tool without kind of giving... Right, okay. So you kind of need a bit of a lead-in. I think... So you're I saying thought that's, that's what I was between. hoping that that slide was for, but I guess... Yeah, I guess I need something about it is is there a better way kind of slide. So, so Jonathan, I think we need a so kind of a transition slide. Is that what you're saying? Something that kind of de describes the solution in in higher detail because what Alex has provided is kind of like a medium level detail slide. Oh no, just to change the diagram header. Oh, okay. So what 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 oh. are you suggesting the diagram header should be? Oh, okay, I see you saying so it's not really a technical overview, it's a, I know, an architectural yeah, overview Yeah, I guess it's a, high, it's a high level architectural so, uh, overview, isn't it? Yeah, so. Maybe just architecture? Yeah. Yeah, I guess, yeah, yeah that does make sense. <laughs> I, I think you need to mention tool or like some similar words. Yeah. It's the tool's architecture, not yeah. the application's architecture. Right, right, right. Because right, it does, right. like, say, user applications. And is that your user application or is that the tool's applications? It, it gets very confusing in that to work out what is the tool and what is what yeah, yeah. The, the user applications are running. You know, okay. So perhaps maybe also change the colour there of the user applications that are a bit more Yeah, it's, it's not that obvious. The colours are only slightly different, aren't they? Yeah. It's certainly not that obvious on this projector with the light. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 no, it, it's, one of, uh, it's a bit naive on my part. The user application is in white and then the other bits are in a very light shade of grey. So okay. it's kind of, if you're looking on a high-res Mac display, it's fine on, on that note. Yeah, that's... Uh, Okay, so I think we've I think we've covered that one. Oh, <coughs> ah, okay. So Catherine, yeah, Catherine makes a good point. So she's saying that it, it's quite easy to get confused or distracted on this slide. So I'll, I'll, in fact, I'll just read out Catherine's question. So you definitely get distracted by this slide. I think you start focusing on comparing what is in JBoss Server One versus Server Two, and beyond, rather than truly understanding the value pieces of the tool. So in, in okay. maybe it's worth not having JWAS Server 2 there initially. Okay. Maybe maybe just have you know, maybe just drop off JWAS Server 2 mm. just and then describe it and then so talk, talk about the standalone case mm. and then say and if your transaction's distributed then you can you can locate the core module on each of the other servers yeah. and they can feed back to the shared data source. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's okay. Fine. So, Catherine agrees with that. Mm. Okay, so we're gonna great, yeah. It might be worth changing the name of the shared data store to analysis data store or something like that, yeah, yeah. And then it would work on the standalone, yeah, because it kind of looks like it looks like it's just like a transport, doesn't it? It looks like yeah, it's just there for because you couldn't figure out a way of sharing data between what's in the Um, okay, so that, that 
Um, uh, I guess you could but, even just put something like data model on there. I mean, that's what's basically oh, stored right, in uh, there. I mean, it's. Uh, I think data store is good. Data store, okay. Yes. Yeah. But it's it was analysis data, data store. It's the analysis data that's being stored. Yeah. Not, yes, uh, yeah. It's not the. It's not application data that you're talking about. No, 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 no. It's. Uh, uh, so when the arrows go into it, come from the data analysis level. From so we're looking. Set, you, you could log pass directly into that, or you could. Um. Yeah. Like do it higher. So you see so your sideways like arrow. This so arrow there. Could that what? maybe come from the next level down. It, it could do. I mean, the, this persistence layer is generally just the, the certain abstraction that makes it easy. So the analysis layer can just. Uh, JPA basically, basically, isn't it? Yeah, it's basically JPA with a kind of data access object over the top. So it, it's, yeah, it's not particularly interesting to it. It's just a, it, it, it's just an, an extra abstraction that um, it, it, it aids with kind of the maintainability of the tool. Yeah, we do, that, I, think, well, I think what you're saying is it doesn't necessarily aid this slide. It's a bit low level, isn't it? So on this slide. Fair enough, yeah. That's, uh, so it might just be enough just the update analysis going straight into the update, so I'll yeah. drop that. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll anything that that that's it. You, you really need the two way arrow into the shared data store as well. Is it two, is it two way? Would yeah, it like reads from the. It'll When you get the data analysis, it'll read from the shared data store to see what's already in the model in order to be able to make inferences about what's been passed on other servers. So from that sense, it'll read in first, make a judgment based on what information it's taken before, what information it has currently from this log line and the model as it stands. Um, so it's so, so, so that's in the level and not in the user interface level. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, okay. It's unfortunate. In an ideal world, you wouldn't need it, but because we're we're kind of having to deal with. Mm. Um, Existing log that were that were written before this tool was conceived, so yeah. you can sometimes have to do some magic to try and yeah, figure out well, what's I, going I, on. I can, I can understand the sort of you know you've got to match transaction IDs up and yeah, and you know, Cor corporate interceptor IDs uh, and corporate so, uh, IDs. Yeah. To, to be honest, yeah. in some ways, yeah, I, I sort of assumed that that sort of thing would almost not be data. You, you know, data coming out is where it's things sort of more non-contextual information so it's matching it up from other things in the shared data store yes i think what you're saying is that at the abstract level yeah. data is going into there yeah. and coming out the other way the fact that it reads some data is neither here nor there it's kind of an implementation detail yeah. Yeah. information is generally flowing into the data store and being read so so, so my thought would be that the log parsing would generate its own context rather than having to read the data store to get the context out because you have to sort of assume that a log is standalone and you know nothing before the log started. Yeah. You would also need a two way arrow between persistence and data analysis. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's very true. true. Yeah, that yeah, is, yeah, yeah otherwise it's not. I, I, yeah. I, I think in general, just having it as a one way into a data store would be a, a better for the conceptual model. Yeah. Because it's okay. not. Um, you don't forget these are distributed transactions. So transactions start in one node, and yeah. one node is stored into other nodes, and the only way to find out where the parent transaction is yeah. is to go and look at the data. But, but it is the so this, so this really subordinate transaction has no way of knowing yeah. which which, which, which uh, parent transaction. But it is the core module of actually doing <coughs> that analysis. Yeah, yeah, that so, has to. So, it, so, so on server two, it's looking at what server one's put into the data store. It doesn't know that server one, it's not aware of any of the other servers, it's just aware of what goes into the data store. So you may have to, uh, part of the big, one of the bigger problems is actually forming this transaction hierarchy. You don't actually get any information because of the way, uh, when you're doing these distributed transactions, it, JBoss uses uh, JTS transactions, which is the implementation of Corber OTS, which, um, you, you basically end up that none of the nodes actually know pretty exactly who their parent is. You have to actually look at things like Corba interceptor request IDs and uh, uh, Corba IIOPs. I'm, I'm going quite a bit more into detail than <coughs> I need to, but because you've got that level, you, you have to actually look 
Um, I think what I'm trying to say is you really do have to look for whether that information has been stored there before because again you're dealing with the asynchronous nature of the passing so you don't know whether the, the parent's going to say I know I've got some kind of subordinate transaction here at this address and then the um, subordinate is going to pass and say uh, pass it and look at that and say oh yes that's me we're related in this way or whether it could happen the other way around whereas the subordinate gets there first knowing I'm a subordinate of um, from this request ID and the parent gets there separately and is then able to piece that together yeah I, so, I, I suppose yeah. I had in my mind that it was like a two-stage parsing you know, and, and maybe that's where you've got your log parsing and data analysis but mm. basically each server you know mm. pieces together the information into a digestible form yeah and then you almost have a, a second level of analysis which actually sort of pieces all the bits together and glues all the, the individual bits of transaction together yeah that, that's exactly because um, that, that you know my sort of <laughs> my thinking of it is each each one is just piling everything up together and right. sometimes pulling it out later and sort of matching all the bits up between the individual servers rather than the individual servers trying to work it out themselves you know before yeah. that module so, you know I, I don't know if that's how it's working or not but yeah so, so, no. so I then need to interrupt you so um, maybe you could take that offline yeah, we've got yeah, to get yeah, onto yeah, the room yeah, as well because yeah, yeah. um, I guess anybody's got any more feedback they can ask Alex after but is there anything kind, of kind of pressing that I know felt that was kind of critical I, I just wondered about timing generally and does it require time synchronization yeah. like is it in time protocol or is NTP good enough or how does it work because there one could be in New York that's going to write to the shared data store later than the events coming out of the other log how is it able to did you say it could match those up even if the clocks were off or yeah even, even if the clocks are off if they come in in completely the wrong order these messages it can still piece together based on uh, it, it's basically matching on a series of events you can see if certain ones are missing you can still come back and and make inferences based on what else is there where this should fit together with in terms of the whole uh, in terms of the whole picture of the transaction so it's a bit like TCP packet sequencing you, you don't necessarily need to get all the acknowledgements in order yeah I, I guess yeah in, in a way it's kind of in that in that style yeah it, you, you kind of the, rather than trying to force some kind of serialized order to it you just accept that they're going to come um, in this asynchronous manner out and you, you it's just you've got the transaction ID haven't you so it's like getting jigsaw pieces mm, yeah. if I like if I bought like five jigsaws and picked random pieces from all the jigsaws as long as you knew which they had the jigsaw number on the back I could throw but, them at you and you yeah. could put them in the right thing well, that, that's when you've got all the pieces of jigsaw you can put it together it's not quite strictly true you don't always have the transaction ID that's missing no, particularly okay. in the sorry am I going a bit too you ruined my analogy <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'll just try to say it wasn't quite that either. All the pieces in the jigsaw don't mm. necessarily, in a few cases, come with the uh, thing on the back. No thing on the back, really. Yeah. So, I, I presume yeah. related to that, it is quite dependent on the log format as well. So, if some random developer does and includes a, a message on the trace messages, it creates the whole um, world. Yeah, that is something we looked at very early on and basically the, the idea behind that was to and I, I mean this is something obviously Paul will be looking at in further development not me but the idea was actually to add some additional um, testing so some additional unit tests to um, the transaction manager so that if you mess up these log messages you can't actually um, break it essentially yeah they kind of already are so yeah. you know this we can't really go changing log messages anyway there's all internationalized and things like that so yeah. Yeah. mind you not the low level ones but yeah. essentially you just when you release a new version you just run all of alex's unit tests yeah. and it tells you if it's broken right anyway yeah terms saying enough's enough okay, right. okay well thank you very much alex yeah.